at singing. Love that song, Amazing Grace. It's a great song uh, to end by and the singing by. So, well, again, I just, I uh, always count it a privilege to be able to, to, to be able to preach, and I never want to take that lightly at all. And we're going to get right into it. If you have your Bibles, please stand and turn to Galatians in chapter number 4. This is where we're going to be tonight. Galatians in chapter number 4. And we're going to begin our reading in verse number 11. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 11. And this is Paul writing a letter to the churches at Galatia, and he starts out in verse number 11 saying, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I thank you for uh, today and for the good service that we had this morning and the preaching of your word uh, that uh, was given this morning, Lord, out of the book of Daniel, Lord, thank you for that, and I pray that you just be with us again tonight, that we'd once again hear from you, and that you'd speak to our hearts, and it's Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing, you may be seated. So the title of my message tonight is stated in form of a question, and that question is, where does the fruit of your zeal come from? Where does the fruit of your zeal come from? It was about, it's been about seven years uh, where I had graduated from Bible college. And during that time when I was in Bible college, uh, up till the time I was uh, graduating, me and the people that I went to college with, we, we were excited. You know, we, we, we were um, really listening to, most of us were listening to uh, what was being taught in the classrooms, and we were really trying to take it all in, and, and, uh, and the more and more we learned, the more excited and passionate that we got for what we were learning and the truth that we were receiving, and, and because of that, we would, we would, during, when we would go to church, uh, we would want to be involved, well, we'd want to be involved in the church church and the different ministries that, that, were, that, that were there at the church, the visitation, and whatever we could get into to just give us more experience and to help us apply what we were learning in the classroom. And then graduation came, and we were all excited about that, and, and we all, you know, left and and uh, went to different places, different states, different churches, and many, many of my classmates got involved in, uh, in being a pastor themselves, or a youth pastor, or some of my classmates are, are missionaries now. And it was, it was just a great thing to see, just the passion that all of us had going out. And now I look back seven years later, and I can see many that I had gone to school with that you wouldn't have known they ever went to a Bible college. You wouldn't have even known that they ever went to church. 
They're completely out of ministry. The passion's not there anymore. And when you think about it, it just it breaks my heart, and it can get discouraging when you when you see just um, oh you know this person has gone this direction now. You know there uh, there's uh, many that I know that have. Uh, f- uh, fallen into different beliefs that they hold to now. Calvinism and such as that, and there's, there's some that aren't in church at all. But then I also look back seven years later, and I can see many who are still actively living in the truth. And and, and serving God and, and, and in, in whatever capacity that they were called to do and, 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 and still have, have that passion, seven years later, still have that passion that they had when they graduated Bible college. And that brings me much joy. Love to see that. Well, here in our passage in Galatians, this is Paul, he writes this letter to the churches at Galatia. And uh, what happened when he was in this region, you could could tell if you just read Paul's letters that Paul had a passion and a zeal for what he was called to do. And he had a passion for the people that that he would come in contact with and and to minister. And he really showed showed them how much he cared and loved for them. And because of that passion and zeal that he had, it was so great that it affected those around him. And you could see that at at, at Galatia, at the churches there in Galatia, where, where they just took in what he was teaching them, and they were really getting it, and they were applying what he was, the truth that he was that he was giving to them, they were applying it to their own lives, and they were going out and doing the same thing that Paul was doing. And then once Paul was was done at at a church and a church was established, he would he would move on to the next church. And by and as he did that, he would keep tabs on the places that he had been just to make sure they see how they were doing, to make sure they were doing all right, because he loved them, he cared for them. And he showed that in his ministry. But then somewhere along the way, he started getting these kind of discouraging reports back from the churches at Galatia. He started getting concerned for them, so he wrote this letter, and in chapter 4 in our text particularly, he expresses his concern that he has for, the, uh, for them. And in our text, we're going to see three different fra- uh, uh, sections of, uh, of verses that um, describe different points that we're, that we're going to point out. The first one is the zeal that Paul had towards the people there at Galatia, towards the churches at Galatia. Look in verse number uh, 11. It, it says, the last part there says, I have bestowed upon you labor in vain, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. <clears throat> Paul worked hard. He worked hard while he was there. He worked hard to convert the people there at Galatia. And for what was, for where their state was now, he was afraid that all that hard work and and effort that he he had put in, that it all might have been in, in vain. But the point is that I want you to get is he worked hard to convert them. And then in verse number Uh, Verse number 13, he says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. The infirmity of the flesh. Paul, he he not only worked hard to convert them, but while he was ministering to them, he, he had physical ailments. Okay, that he was dealing with. But even through those times where... He might not have felt like ministering to them. He says, I, through those times, I, I ministered unto you. 
I preached unto you. I preached the gospel unto you. And so just through those phrases right there and through those sections of verses, we can see that Paul, he had a passion and he had a zeal was great towards the people there. He cared for them so much and, and worked hard even through physical ailments. He preached unto them. And then the second thing that we see is uh, the, the churches at Galatia, their zeal towards Paul. In verse number 14, Paul says that even in my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So what that's saying is Paul had something, I don't know what it was, but there was something there physically that would tempt, that, would, that tempted the Galatians, the people there, to reject him. I don't know what that I don't know what that that was, but there uh, there was something there. But but instead of rejecting him, the Galatians did the exact opposite. Paul says, "You treated me like an angel of God." It's not saying that they they thought he was an angel of God, but that they they loved him so much that they treated him like you know that God had given him a gift. This man is special, and the, and. And, and they could see that through Paul's preaching and the, just the passion that he has, that he was serious about what he was saying. And they loved him for it, and they, they, uh, they, they took care of him and cared for him. And then in verse number 15, the last part there, Paul was so convinced of how much they cared for him that he, that he said in verse number 15, I bear you record that, if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. I don't know if that's like something back in that day that they did to, for a sign of, you know, commitment towards uh, one. I, I don't speculate on, on that very much, but I believe the point of what it's drawing is, is that these people love Paul so much that if it were possible that they would have given their own eyes to Paul. They cared and loved him so much. And the passion that he had and the zeal that Paul had put an impact and effect and infected them as well to where they started doing and following Paul and doing the same things that he did. And then we get to our last point and uh, in, in phrases of verses where we see the changed relationship that the churches there at Galatia had towards Paul. The changed relationship. In verse number 11, Paul, Paul said there, he says, I'm, I'm afraid of you. I, I, I'm concerned about what, what I'm hearing back and what, what's going on there. Where is the, for verse 15, he says, where's then the blessedness ye spake of? Man, we had a special relationship when we were there. It was special. We, 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 we had a great time together. You, I, I loved you. I poured my uh, life into you, and I helped you, and ministered unto you, and, 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 and you cared for me, and you loved me, and, and helped me out as well. We had that special relationship. Where, where is... Where is that language that you had back then? Where is the blessedness you, you speak of? It's gone. Where did that go? And then worst of all, in verse number 15, he asks, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth? When I was there with you, I, 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 I spoke the truth unto you, and I gave you the truth. And I'm still speaking the truth now. I, I'm, I'm still telling the truth. How is it that I feel like we're enemies now? What has happened? What happened? When, how did this relationship towards Paul and the Galatians just change so drastically? Well, and the answer is actually uh, pretty simple. Paul, he left. 
He wasn't there anymore. And, and uh, that's not a knock on Paul at all. That's what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to leave. That was part of his ministry, you know, go, going in and, and, and spreading the gospel around to people and, and giving them the truth and ministering unto them and seeing uh, a, a church planted and once it was established to move on to the next place. That's what God had for him. That was the ministry that he had. But he left, and then other, another group came in and started affecting them, zealously affecting them. Paul says in verse number 17, but, but not well. Then he says in verse number 18, but it is, a good, it is good to be zealous zealously affected always in a good thing. This, this, this is what the, 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 the Galatians, when Paul was there, they were zealously affected in a good thing. Being zealously affected in a good thing was not the Galatians' problem. That was not their problem. They didn't have a problem with being zealously affected in a good thing. They, 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 had, they, they had that, and they had that there when, when, when Paul was there. You know, when Paul uh, came there, he would preach unto people that may have had different beliefs or may have not known what, what salvation was and everything like that. And Paul would come in there with his passion and zeal that he had for the gospel and for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, no, what you need to understand is that in order to go to heaven, in order to spend eternity with Jesus Christ, you need to understand that you're a sinner and that you, through your own power, you can't do anything to save you, but, but, but to come to the realization that you need Jesus, you need a Savior who died on the cross for your, for your sins, the perfect Lamb of God, and come to that understanding and ask him to save you and to forgive you from your sins. And he'll save you. And they took that and, 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 and were affected by it in such a, great, such a great way. But then in the last part of verse number 18, Paul adds this. You were zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Your, your zeal can't end when I'm gone. Like, it, it can't, it must continue. Your zeal for, for the truth must continue even when I'm not there. You can't depend upon me for your continued zeal. And that's what happened. They, they, they fed on the zeal and the passion that Paul had. But when he left, well, then it was gone. And they just moved on to other people that had zeal and was feeding off of theirs. Uh, off of theirs. Paul says, it, your zeal being zealously affected in a good thing it must continue even when I'm not there. And Paul, with that phrase, he hits on something that's a, a very common difficulty even nowadays for people, which is the transfer of motivation from an external source to an inward source. Going from the dependence on, on others for motivation to something that flows within your heart. You know, it's easy for me, and it's easy for many, many of us, to be motivated by someone. But then, when, when that person is not around, that motivation, if it's a good thing, can be hard for a lot of us, for, for us to continue being motivated. And the reason why is that motivation that we got from someone else was not transferred properly into our own heart for it to continue. 
When that transfer doesn't happen, there's great danger in that. But when it does happen, there's incredible joy. Incredible, incredible joy. The fruit of Paul's zeal is not what the Galatians were supposed to get, but the, the, the seeds that were, in that, that were in that fruit were supposed to be planted in their hearts so then they could have their own fruits of zeal that would grow and that they would have and that they would be able to feed off of. And based upon the type of soil that each individual had, that seed would either take root or it wouldn't. And when you're living off of the fruit of someone else's zeal that God had planted in someone else, when that person is gone, it's not going to last very much longer. You'll soon be moving on to the next thing and then the next thing. And then the next thing. And you know what? Soon those who have uh, or had a special relationship with you that, that, uh, that were, um, um, you know, a great spiritual leader in your life or whatever that might be, they, they're, they're going to start asking the questions and they'll be saying this, I, I, I'm worried about you. What, what happened to the blessedness you spoke of before? What, where did that language go? And are we enemies now? Have, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? I, 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 was told, I spoke the truth to you back then when I was there with you, and and I'm still speaking the truth now, but I feel like we're enemies. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis and chapter number 50. Uh, This story picks up towards uh, where, where Joseph is reunited with his family, with his brothers and with his father, and he brings them to Egypt. And we are in verse number 15. It says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requit us all the evil which, he, which uh, we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, thy, thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now, we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. So, in, in, I'm sure most of us know the, the story of Joseph, but uh, Joseph, he had a special relationship with his father. His fa- he loved his father, and his father, Jacob, loved him, gave him a coat of many, uh, many co- colors, and, and, and really spoiled Joseph. And they just had the, a special relationship where, where Joseph would do anything really, that his father would ask him to do, and he would honor his wishes in that. And his brothers, towards the end here, obviously they had done much evil to Joseph, and they sold him basically into slavery, you know, and, and you know the story there. But Joseph's brothers were so convinced that after their father had died, that Joseph would change and that he would seek revenge and, and he would kill them and, and punish them for what, what they did to him. They were so convinced of that that in verse number 16, they sent a messenger to Joseph saying, Hey, hey Joseph, um, remember what your father said All right, before he died. He, he commands you to forgive 
the trespass of, of, of us, of, of your brethren and their sin. Okay, for, you know, we did a evil unto you, and now we pray, forgive us the trespass of your, of, uh, uh, your, your servants. Okay, they were so convinced that they, they had to, that, that they had to say that, hoping that, that by reminding uh, Joseph of Jacob's wishes, that he would honor those wishes of Jacob, even when Jacob had died. And if you know the story, that wasn't necessary at all. Joseph, in the last part of 17, he, it says that Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Joseph didn't have any thought of that. He wasn't planning to do anything. The reason why was, was he had that special relationship with Jacob, and Jacob was such, had such an impact on Joseph but that, that, that uh, uh, passion and zeal maybe that uh, Jacob had was, didn't just end there with Joseph. Joseph made it his own belief, his own passion, his own zeal to continue to walk in truth. He had that. Um, I have got a father and a dad, and I would say I have a special relationship with my dad. I'd say me and all my siblings have a special relationship uh, with him. And uh, um, I've got my father-in-law, and, uh, and I would even say that I've got a special relationship with my father-in-law. You know, they, they, they both, those are two influential men in my life, and uh, I know they, they love me and that they care for me, and I love them, and I care for them. And they have poured so much into me, trying to uh, just, just, just trying to lead me and share with me just truth from God's word on, on uh, just getting direction in my life and knowing uh, that I'm going the right direction every time. They've, they've done that. They poured their, their time and effort into me in that way. And now I have kids of my own. I've got um, a little girl and I've got a little boy. And you know, some, someday, there's going to be a time where I'm going to get a call. And, and I'll have to say to my kids that Grandpa's not here anymore. Papa's not here anymore. And I, I hope, Lord willing, that that's, that's um, a time that, that is uh, still very far away, but the t that time will come. And when that time comes, I don't want my kids to worry if their daddy is going to change because their grandpa and papa aren't there anymore to influence him. They should never have to worry. When my grandpa died... I never had a thought that went into my mind wondering, well, I wonder what dad's going to be like now. If he's going to be the same now that grandpa's done. It never, came through my, it, it never came through my mind because I knew just through spending time with my dad and, and spending time with, uh, 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 even with my father-in-law that, that the passion and the zeal that they have for the truth of God's word is their own. It's not, they're, they're not, they're not, they don't have to feed off of someone else's passion and zeal. They've got their own that they can feed off for the truth. And it'll make them stay there. And that's the same thing that I want. And I don't want my kids to ever have to think that because of, you know, uh, the direction in, in life I, I go, I want them to, without a doubt, know that even with their grandpa and with their papa gone, that their dad is, still has that passion and zeal to walk in truth. And you know, there's, for all of us, there's those people in our lives that, that uh, have poured so much uh, into you, you know, I don't know every, 
um, everyone, where the backgrounds that they came from, but there's, there's been someone that's been influential in your life and they've cared for you and they had a passion and zeal for you to, to give you true direction and to speak the truth to you and they had an effect on your life. They affected you. <clears throat> and they might still be affecting you now. And the hope and prayer is, and just what I want to bring before you is, when that person who's been influential in your life is no longer there to have an influence and effect on you, is that zeal and passion to walk in truth your own or is it just someone else's that you're feeding off of? Because if, it, if, if that's the case, and when that fruit is gone, you're in a dangerous place. You're in a dangerous place. You know, us as a church, <coughs> uh, we've obviously gone through our, our struggles, and then the Lord uh, brought Brother uh, Woodcock here, and, and I, I, you know, I... I can say, at least for me and, and, and for my family, that uh, uh, Brother Woodcock, when he came here, that, that you could tell that he, he cared and he loved this church. And he wanted to see this church um, uh, start walking, you know, to continue to walk in truth and to, and, and to grow and to really thrive. And you could, you could tell that Brother Woodcock, he cares for us and he loves us and his passion and zeal that he has for the Word of God and for giving us the truth each and every service that, that we walk in. I can say, at least personally for me, that that has had an effect on me and I believe it's had an effect on many of us here, just, just how he's gotten us to, uh, together to be more unified um, as we should be. And, and, and just, just getting us a, a, a excited to just, you know, being a part of the ministry of the church here. And, and, and just helping out in whatever capacity that that might be or, or that you uh, that might believe that God wants you to do. He, he's affected us in that way. But Brother Woodcock's not going to be here forever. It's going to be a time where the Lord moves him on to go somewhere else and to help other churches. The question is, church, are, are, are we going to be a, a, a church that Brother Woodcock, you know, five years or whatever from when, when he leaves, that he'll look at us and his hands will be in his head in sorrow because of the direction that we went. Or if, or his head his hands, his head will be in his hands weeping in joy because of the continued direction that we've kept to walk in truth. And I just want I, I encourage each and every one of us that we evaluate where we are and that that the passion and the zeal that we might have that we're not just, you know, feeding off of someone else's zeal, but we actually make that our own zeal and passion for the Word of God and for the truth. So then when, when we have someone like Brother Woodcock that, pa that passes on and that leaves and we get someone else, we still have that passion and zeal to walk in truth. And if we have that church, we're going to continue to grow and, and, and we won't you know, sway back, you know, back and forth to this direction or that direction, but we'll always be able to stand in truth and to serve God because that passion and that zeal is our own. That's the 
prayer, that hope and prayer that I have. And, you know, even <clears throat> the younger ones, the kids and, and teenagers, you know, you've got parents that, that, that love you and that, and, and, and that care for you. And they're giving it their efforts. They're working hard to just give you the truth and, and, and to um, direct you in the truth. But you know, there's going to be a time when you're going to move out from your parents' house and your parents aren't going to be there. And if you don't make that passion and zeal to walk in truth your own, you're not going to be in a good place after that effect that whoever, whoever had an effect on you is not there anymore. So if I can encourage everyone today, it, 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 it'd be this, to make sure that the passion and zeal that we have for the truth of the Word of God and to walking in truth is our own and not just someone else's. Because if it's someone else's, then once they're gone, then we'll just go to someone else who might zealously affect us, which might not be good. <clears throat> if I could just end with this quote. <clears throat> it's for a quote from uh, Brother Wayne Hardy. He's a pastor in Stillwater, Oklahoma. <clears throat> And he says this, Is your zeal for God your own, or is it a temporary effect of certain zealous people around you? Where does the fruit of your zeal come from? Uh, let's, let's pray. We'll, we'll stand and, and pray. <clears throat> That's all I've got for you to, tonight. Where does the fruit of your zeal come from? Heavenly Father, I thank you for...